Good morning. Wow. I was not expecting this much of an audience at 9 a.m. on Sunday at a FOSTEM, so thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about how I was at FOSTEM five years ago. I told you all a whole bunch of things, and I was utterly wrong so many ways. It's actually kind of amusing. But who am I? Um, my name's Richard. I've been working on OpenSUSE like, since it began. Um, I've been a customer of SUSE's. I've been a contributor. I've yeah, a bit of everything. QA engineer. I've been working there for 10 years now, or almost 10 years. Uh, these days, I am a ridiculous advocate of, of rolling releases. It's what everybody should be using. Um, I created the MicroS desktop. My day job is the release, being one of the release engineers for Tumbleweed and MicroOS. I also do a bit of consulting, and I also do a bit of photography. Um, but, yeah, a long time ago in a room, actually just on the other side of this campus, I was here at FOSTEM telling everybody that yeah, containerized applications, so things like Flatpak, Snap, app images, you know, the idea that graphical apps in some portable format are absolutely, utterly terrible, and nobody should be ever using them ever, and they were going to eat all of our users, um, and, yeah, it's just going to be horribly, horribly wrong. Um, and I, I even started the presentation with quippy comments, like, yeah, those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I even made really unflattering comparisons, like doing diagrams from Windows uh, architecture and pointing out, you know, Windows has all these wonderful runtimes where you can have different environments and run your application on top. And, you know, it was absolutely terrible in Windows. It's going to be absolutely terrible when we do the same thing in Linux. Um, giving the examples of all of the security issues that you see in Windows in this kind of approach. You know, things like security relevant DLLs lurking in some folder in your, your Windows machine, you know, being an absolute nightmare to patch, an absolute nightmare to fix when it goes wrong. You know, all these horrible update issues, you know, how do you end up getting an update on your Windows or your Mac machine? Well, you download some EXE or some bundle and then there's some updater in it does whatever the heck it wants on its machine. Licensing issues, especially with open source, you know, how do you mix and match all these different licenses together in one cohesive thing? And, you know, it's just going to eat up all of your disk space. And then I, yeah, went back to this slide again um, and then started talking about the various technologies at the time, 2017, were out there doing this containerized runtime stuff. And I would compare this lovely Windows diagram to this lovely canonical diagram, which looks very, very similar, because actually it is. The idea is similar, the concept is similar, but as you'll see, just because the concept is similar doesn't necessarily mean the whole idea is bad. Execution does matter. And it wasn't just Snap, I wasn't just shitting on Ubuntu because I don't like Ubuntu. Um, I was doing the same with Flatpak. And I was, yeah, basically pointing out that this whole containerized application idea was repeating the same issue. You know, we were going to be going down this road of security-relevant libraries lurking in all of these snaps and flat packs. Back then, we didn't necessarily have a good story about how are we going to update these things, how are we going to make, keep them maintained, who was going to look after all of these base snaps and and, you know, run times in Flatpak and the like. You know, who was going to look at all of the legal issues and review the possible licensing issues of bundling these things together? And who was going to buy everybody bigger hard disks? And the kind of main conclusion that I left with, which, despite the fact you'll see I was wrong about a lot of what I said, I still actually hold true, is at the heart of it, when distributing software, it doesn't matter if you're doing it as a container, or as a full-blown fat OS distributor, or anything in between with any kind of fancy technology, the responsibilities are the same. You know, app image, flat pack, snap, you know, might make it easier to be the upstream than giving out your application to the users, that's great, but the responsibilities are still the same that distributors have been doing in distributions for years. You know, you have to worry about maintainability, you have to worry about the security, you have to worry about, yeah, licensing and all this wonderful stuff. So they're going to have to borrow all of the same stuff. So five years ago, I gave this presentation. Um, there was lots of people in the audience from AppImage, Snap, and, and Flatpak. 
Some of them said very nice things to me. Some of them said very unnice things to me. Um, starting with App Image, um, they took a lot of what I said, surprisingly, on board and really ran with it. You know, in, you know, I said all this stuff in February 2017, and by June 2017, I was saying stuff like this on stage. Um, this was at the, taken at the OpenSUSE conference. This was on the App Image website for, well, longer than I wish it was. Um, <laughs> but the reason it was because in that short window, App Images thought they could address most of my concerns by actually, obviously, running to the OpenSUSE build service and working with the OpenSUSE build service guys and integrating App Image really quite nicely with it at the time. So the idea being, you know, the prob you know, the app image wasn't the problem. Maybe the way we, you know, you build app images is the problem. If you build them in a nice auditing build system and you know have the whole thing tracked with dependencies in our in a build system and you you know build it reproducibly and you do all the licensing reviews there, then OBS could be the solution to all of the app images problem. Um, and yeah. They worked really nicely with it, and it, they gave all these promises. They'd be encouraging people to be using OBS as the main app image building tool, and you know we'd all move on happy in a, a nice, you know, unified way forward. And I even said things to Snappy and Flatback, like you know you're falling behind app image at this point. You know, saying app image had a better build story, and you know they were working with other people and telling people to be more like app image. Um, and I still was badgering on. By the way, you can tell all my old slides because they have this thing at the bottom, so you can yeah, see old me compared to new me. I was still worrying a little bit about dependencies because, as you'll see, App Image makes some really interesting assumptions. But I was, you know, June 2017, kind of hopeful that you know we'd get to a point where everybody would be working together and we'd have sort of a, maybe a new consistent runtime and things could move forward. I was also hopeful that we might have sandboxing, finally, because, you know, Snap kind of had some with AppArmor. Flatpak has bubble wrap. You know, maybe AppArmor would be the way forward. How wrong I was. So now, five years later, where are we? And I don't want to go deep down in technical issues but too much because... A lot of this isn't just technical. It, you know, we're an open source project. Any technical issue can be fixed, right? It is a lot about what are people actually doing? What do they actually care about? Where are they actually taking things? You know, where, you know, what are we actually doing? So let's judge people by their own standards. This is a screenshot from the current App Image website. And it says, use this to make Linux apps that run everywhere. But they don't run everywhere. And they say, as a user, it should be as easy to install as it is on a Mac or Windows machine. But they're not. And they say, you don't have to learn all these distributions with all these different distros doing things different ways. Technically, that's true. You just need to learn all these different distributions and doing all the different things. And you have to build your own to put in your app image. Um, and I'm not just you know, saying this to, to you know, Cool shade on them. Um, you know, these we have. I have users on microOS who are trying to run app images, and they can't because app images require Fuse 2. I'm a rolling release. I haven't shipped Fuse 2 for like a year. I've been using Fuse 3, and you can't get an app image to work with Fuse 3. It has to be Fuse 2. The portable image format that isn't portable because it makes assumptions about stuff that's on the base OS, and not just you know, not just, you know, weird stuff like views, but even down and dirty in the kernel. If you're running Debian and you try and run an Electron app, it's not going to work properly because the kernel in Debian isn't built the way that App Image is expecting the kernel to be running. So this is great promise, and it's going to work in some places, but only if you're lucky enough that your distro has the same assumptions baked into it that App Image has. And this is a recurring issue, even reading the app image documentation for building app images. You know, it tells you, as a developer, think about 
all of the distros where you want your app image to run on. So the whole promise of you know, not worrying about distros goes away. You have to worry about more of them than you normally would and put every single dependency which might not be fulfilled by that distro in your app image. So yeah, avoid distros by building a huge one and putting it in a big table. It's a lot of work. It's way too much work. I utterly respect anybody using it because they're probably doing more work than I am doing a rolling release. Especially when the recommendations for what you put in that giant app image is the oldest, crustiest stuff you can find. They, don't rec they recommend avoiding using anything new because anything new is more likely to have compatibility issues with older distros. So literally find the oldest distro that's still supported and use that as your base for building app image. Which, you know, also seems a bit of a problem to me because, you know, if you're always picking the oldest, the oldest is always the first one to not get maintenance updates. So you're just always going to be rebasing on some crusty, old, almost out of date LTS to do what you want to do with app image. It, it just doesn't make any sense by their own standards. And they tell everybody that it's installing just like on a Mac. You know, just download the, the binary, put it on your desktop, right click it, make it ex executable, and it'll run. Which, you know, 15 years ago, that's true. That's how you run something on a Mac. I own a Mac now. That's not how you run stuff on a Mac. There's not a single Mac application I've ever installed that works that way. You know, even the Apple documentation makes it very, very clear that if you're downloading something from the internet and you're double-clicking it on a Mac, it's going to run an installer, which is a terrible thing anyway. But it needs to run an installer. When you're downloading random stuff from the internet, there needs to be checks for dependencies. There needs to be some... Yeah, modification to what's on the host. So every random downloaded Mac application has an installer, just like Windows, or it's done in a, in a app store where you know, Apple are controlling all that kind of things and helping that along. So yes, I was wrong about AppImage. First thing, it was terrible, because they did try and make an effort, but then I was wrong again, because it's actually even worse than I said five years ago. You know, they fail to do everything that they set out to do. They don't do anything to address the actual problems with software releasing. You know, dependency problems are just hand wavied worse than anyone else could possibly do. Licensing issues, pff, security, maintenance, <laughs> good luck. Just build a new distro and ship it again. You know, and I, this is worse than we do in distros with all of the faults I will admit distros have on this. Like, so please, do not use app images. And also, they're not nice people, because they kept publishing this for like four years after I told them to take it down, and I had to threaten to sue them. So, like, <laughs> they're just not nice. Now, Snap. Despite my reservations back in 2017, actually, Snap was, at the time, the one I was most optimistic about. You know, at the time, Canonical were actively collaborating with other distributions. Um, they even invited me to a Snap workshop, um, trying to get Snap supported in as many Linux distributions as possible. They had a, an approach of upstream first. They were promising that all of their app armor patches and, and all of the enablement they had to do was going to end up in the kernel and going to end up being upstream. At the time, in 2017, you could run your own Snap store, so you could have your own repository for, for downloading Snaps. And Unlike Flatpak, where you know, it's much more just graphical, they also had a story for you know, non-graphical apps. And you know, it's only five years ago, but back then, you know, everybody wasn't necessarily using containers for server stuff the way we are now. So you know, it was interesting on all those levels. But it's five years later. And all of the promises of snap confinement working everywhere so you can have your nice sandboxed Snap application hasn't come true. You know, SnapD does not support confinement on most non-Ubuntu distributions, and even some Ubuntu distributions. And you know, this was posted on their forums three years ago now. That was the case three years ago. You know, users still waiting to get any kind of proper sandboxing and security with Snaps, still not there. And then this was posted this month. Still promising. It might happen. 
But it's been five years. None of the app armor stuff is in the kernel yet. None of the enablement we need is in the kernel yet. Distros can't easily, or really at all, you know, keep with an upstream kernel and get Snap running in the way Snap should be running. So if you run a Snap on a non-Ubuntu distribution, you're probably running it in an incredibly secure, un insecure way. You know, do you trust that random software deliverer with you know, access to everything on your machine? Probably not. At least that random software developer using Snap isn't using their own Snap store because they can't anymore. You know, 2017 you could, then they released a new version of SnapD, so now the only version of, of the Snap store that works with SnapD is Canonicals. So, you know, it's an open source package format, but it's a closed source delivery format. You know, you're only going to get that software from Canonical, you know, and if you read up on it, you know, there's lots of examples where Canonical have done the right thing and, you know, handled sn snaps that were, you know, malicious and got them off quickly, but it's like, how do you know? You know, you're just trusting Canonical that they're always doing the right thing because you, you can't see. You can't see what they're putting on there. You can't see how they get there. You can't do it yourself. You know, if you trust Canonical, that's fine. But, you know, I'm much more open source orientated myself. I'd rather, you know, even if I am trusting somebody else, I'd rather to be able to have a look and see what's going on in there. Maybe run my own, maybe compare something alongside, you know. And yes, for most developers, or at least most small developers, this is free. So you can build your Snap and publish it to the, the canonical Snap store you know, with no effort. But as soon as you start getting bigger, as soon as you start becoming a bit of an ISV or doing stuff with IoT with lots of devices, then canonical wants you to have a brand store. Um, and this is in the documentation for, for Snapcraft where it comes to building. When you actually have a look at the price list for having a Snap store, you know, the price list is kind of dear. You know, do you really want to be spending at least 5,000 euros just to be able to publish your application on somebody else's server under your name? But I can understand if people are buying into this, you know, I can definitely understand why Canonical aren't in a rush to change it. It's probably making them a good bit of money. On OpenSUSE, like I said, at the time in 2017, they were working with us. Now, not going so well. Um, Snap is the only bit of software in all of my years doing anything release managery at OpenSUSE where it's failed more than one security audit. Um, it's the only bit of software where I've had to reject it multiple times. And there was good collaboration going on to get those issues fixed, but since 2019, that's kind of fizzled out. Haven't seen anything since. So when it comes to Snap, you know, I was wrong. I was really kind of keen on Snap back in 2017. And these days, I can't really say that much nice about it. The upstream first promises have, have all stalled. There doesn't seem to be an effort to get it really moving again and on other distributions. So, you know, it's not a portable format by any stretch of any imagination. There's no open source delivery option, you know, even if Snap you know, the Snap Store may always be the best way of doing it anyway. Uh, There's a case to be made for that, even if there was a, a, yeah, an open source way. And, you know, it's not really a viable alternative for something like Flatpak until, you know, unless you use Ubuntu, unless you trust Canonical, and unless you're willing to give them money to distribute your stuff. And so, Flatpak. Now, I need to kind of do a little bit of a, a, a detour on this, because when I was talking five years ago about all of this stuff, one of the things that I was kind of trying to pitch in the side thing there was this idea that, you know, well, everybody should be using rolling releases. I really, really believe that, and I still believe that now. And I really think, you know, in this modern age, to get applications in the hands of users you know, a rolling base operating system is the absolute key. You know, you need to have it all built together, need to have everything, yeah, integrated, built consistently, tested consistently, and, you know, taking the fair share of the maintenance and security burden, and then shipping it all in a way that the users don't really care that the, everything's churning around underneath, you know, it just works. And at SUSE, we've still been working on this. 
we have an uh, operating system called OpenSUSE MicroOS. Vanilla MicroOS is much more server orientated. Um, it's immutable, like CoreOS and other similar immutable platforms. Can't be modified during runtime at all. It's rolling, so changing snapshots, it's actually using the same code base as Tumbleweed, so every day, almost. It's small, but small enough to do the job that it's meant to do. And the assumption is, you know, that server is going to do just one job in a data center, so, you know, a VM running one RPM or a VM running containers and then, you know, as many containers on top, but, you know, the job is a container from the, the operating system point of view. And this is working really, really quite well. In fact, SUSE also has commercial products based on this. SLE Micro is based directly off OpenSUSE Micro OS. The, the new SUSE Alp you might have heard of, where we're thinking of doing like a whole new ecosystem of, of enterprise distros. You know, that's building off what we did with SLE Micro and OpenSUSE Micro OS. But me, you know, I'm, I'm still a desktop guy at heart. So, you know, doing this with my day job, I found myself asking, yeah, find myself asking, but like, okay, so I've got this nice small OS and it can run just one thing. You know, what if that just one thing was a desktop? And so I started the MicroOS desktop project sort of alongside regular MicroOS. And yeah, basically it's a modern Chromebook-like, Silverblue-like uh, environment where you have a nice minimal base system my recommendation would be running the GNOME one, that's the one that's most maintained, with a desktop environment on top. And the basic configuration tools are, yeah, they're in there, but everything else is provided by somewhere else. In fact, everything else is provided by Flatpak. So this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this presentation. I kind of have to explain how in five years I went from Flatpak is the devil to Flatpak is the only thing you should be running on your desktop. Because I talked to some of the people that I was talking to back then, and this is kind of their expression. Because five years ago, when I was, at, when I was talking about this stuff, I was meanest about Flatpak than all the other ones. I was even invited to Guadec, and I gave the meanest talk I have ever given to anybody, right to the people who were actually developing the thing. Um, and they, the, the guys from Gnome, they, they listened. Um, I wasn't right. I'm not right about everything. That's the recurring theme of this presentation. Um, but they challenged some of my, my, my opinions, but they accepted at least the, the cool ones that actually mattered. And Flatpak has changed. You know, like I was talking about earlier, you know, responsibility is the key issue when you're talking about delivering software. You know, if it's, no matter how you're distributing it. You, know, you need to be thinking about dependencies and licenses and maintenance and security. And one thing that Flatpak does very, very well is basically take all of that away from the distribution and make it the packager's problem. <laughs> Not great if you're a packager, but they do it in a way that actually probably lowers the burden for everybody. So that's nice. You know, automation and technology is great. But really, you know, dependencies become the issue of the person making the Flatpak. Licenses become the, the issue there maintenance, security, et cetera. So distros can stop worrying about it. And like I say, Flatpak does this very well with their runtime concept, where you know, if you're building an application for GNOME, you have a GNOME runtime. If you're building an application for KDE, you have a KDE runtime. Elementary have, have their runtime as well. And then for everything else, there's kind of the generic free desktop runtime, which you know, is a little bit heavier and clunkier, but gets the job done. And back in 2017, this terrified me. Not because there was competing distributions, because I'm used to competing distributions. The question was really, you know, are these mini distributions going to be maintained anything like the one, you know, every other distro out there? You know, are these going to handle CVEs well? Are they going to not have horrific licensing issues? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we've been, they've been doing this for five years now. These runtimes are very well maintained. You know, these are snapshots from, from their various Git trees. You know, they're all updating very, very quickly, keeping up with their respected upstreams of GTK and QT and what have you, handling CVEs very, very well. I'll do more about that later. You know, so basically, they're handling this just as well as any other distribution does. 
maybe even better in some cases because they're narrower in scope. They've actually got less work to do themselves than a full-blown distribution with tens of thousands of packages. So you've got your runtimes and you've got your Flatpak application on top of that, but what about the Flatpak client? You know, especially if you think about what I was just talking about with Snap earlier with you know, all of the issues with App Armor and custom patches and, and what have you. Well, as a distribution guy, getting Flatpak in my distribution is really not that hard at all. You need to have the client on there, but you know, you're not having to worry about a huge chain of dependencies and a whole bunch of plumbing to get it running. I don't need to have Fuse 2 on my distro. You know, all I need to have is bubble wrap, OS3, and a couple of XDG packages. And they themselves don't really pull that much in as, as well. So it's small, it's simple, it's relatively easy and self-contained. Doesn't cause me huge build chains when I have to rebuild the whole thing in Tumbleweed. It's a really nice ecosystem to just plop on top of my distro, and then all of the applications come from Flatpak. From a licensing perspective, all the Flatpaks on Flathub are checked. They all have to have some kind of license that allows open redistribution, or legal redistribution. Or they do also support proprietary stuff. You can get a, a Spotify Flatpak. But obviously, you can't have the source code for the, the you know, Spotify binary in their Git tree. So all of the proprietary stuff has to be pulled through by discrete declared links. And the Flatpak, well, specifically the Flathub team, you know, are checking that verifying that things aren't changing there, not letting yeah, you know, nasty things happen and binaries flip around. So at the very least, you, know, you may not know exactly what horrible thing is in this, whole, this sandbox, but it's sandboxed. It's not much of a threat to your machine anyway. And you know it's the one that was sent at the submission time. You know it was the one that was reviewed. You know it isn't changing unexpectedly. So basically, it's as good or as better as any other distribution out there with their native packages. When it comes to maintenance, basically the same story. You know, just like OpenSUSE, Flathub doesn't like Flatpaks to have distro-specific packages or Flatpak-specific packages. You know, they want as everything upstream as possible. They have an incredibly robust build, test, publish workflow. They're not using OBS. I wish they was. They're not using OpenQA. I wish they were. But you know, what they're using is just as good maybe in some ways it's better. They can actually like, give everyone nice test channels for testing their application, which I really think I want to copy sometime. But yeah, it's maintained. It's easy, you know, easy for maintainers to keep their app maintained, and that is all ticking over nicely. From a security point of view, well, Flatpak is the only one that works everywhere. It's the only one that you, those applications are sandboxed. The portal concept where, you know, basically holes are, are pegged through the, the, uh, the sandbox to, you know, give you things like access to the file picker and, you know, other parts of the file system and the like, you know, has proven to be secure enough and, you know, expandable enough. You know, it's not great. It's not perfect. Nothing ever is. But it's doing the job and it's doing the job well and these applications are working very well. And Flatpak CVEs, you know, happen very, very rarely. And when they do happen, they're not these terrifying, scary things because the thing is architected very, very well. So, you know, the last CVE that I could find was in February 2022. You know, it was a medium score. It was fixed incredibly quickly. I think every distribution had no problem adding that because, again, like I mentioned earlier, given the client is very well structured, you know, you don't have a huge dependency chain. Even the most ancient of, of LTSS distros can then just happily get the patch in, get the thing running. So when I started the MicroS desktop, I adopted Flatpak from Flathub, actually November 2017, so if you put the timeline in there, you know, I did change my opinion quite a bit from the beginning of February 2017 to the end. Um, but I was using Flatpak as it was the one that I could work with. You know, I couldn't use Snap, couldn't use App Image, um, and I didn't trust it that much at the time. You know, I was thinking, like you've seen with other, uh, other distributions, of building my own flat packs and using them rather than trusting Flathub, or doing like Fedora does with, you know, they build their own and then they also give Flathub with some kind of filtering. 
But I didn't really want to mess with that at the beginning of my project, doing all of this, so I just opted for trusting FlatHub first, and then waiting for the problems to surface. And it's five years later, and I'm still waiting. Like, we haven't had a single issue with the MicroS desktop where a FlatHub application really got in the way and needed us to think, okay, you know, we can't trust these guys, we should start doing it on our own. It, it just hasn't happened. You know, the few times an application hasn't worked right, well, we send a patch and we work with them because that's how open source is meant to work, right? So as a distribution guy, I've realized, you know, we don't need to be building these giant, humongous, huge code bases, you know, even though that's still what we do with Tumbleweed. You know, I don't, me, myself, I'm purely a microOS person now. All of my servers are microOS. My desktop here is microOS. I'm using a tiny 1,000 package fraction of my Tumbleweed code base. And everything else is coming from containers, some of which are built from that much bigger code base. And all my graphical stuff is coming from Flaub. And my life is good, and I'm happy. And this presentation is LibreOffice from Flaub. So, my final thoughts, which I'm realized I'm actually fin finishing them a little bit early, but that's good, more time for Q&A. Flat packs are ready for prime time. The other ones aren't. You know, don't use app image. Only use Snap if you trust Canonical. But, you know, we're here at Fostem. Flat packs are the better way to go for people like you who are here at Fostem. <laughs> and my system automatically updated in the background. Uh, yeah. Desktop Linux distros do not need to package the whole world. If you're a distro builder, think about following the model we are doing with MicroS Desktop. Think about, if not narrowing your scope because you're building the packages and you don't want to tell maintainers to go away, then at least just you know start drawing your focus more on just what you need to be doing. Start testing that part more. Start telling your users you know that's the bit you can really really trust and you know give some secondary class to the to, to the old-fashioned way of doing things. Yes. So you are telling us that flat packs run everywhere. Is that also true for different architectures? That is true, at least for ARM. For Z, probably not. But do you really have that many desktops in a mainframe? Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, then that's something I'm sure the FlatHub team wouldn't mind. Well, I'm sure we could get that working on flat pack. Like, if there's if there's a need there, then. Also thinking about a risk five, of course, and yeah. stuff like that. So. Yeah, but then that kind of, you know, point actually nicely draws me to my my sort of finishing point. Really, you know, none of this stuff is ever going to be perfect. You know, no technology ever is. That's why we do this stuff in the open. That's why we do this stuff open source. So when things aren't perfect and aren't the way they are, aren't covering an architecture that you want or whatever, you know, isn't it better to go to a project that is already going in that direction, that is trying to be available to everybody, that is open to, you know, open to me yelling at them for months about how terrible they are, and then work with them to get it all done, rather than sticking in your own tiny little sandbox, doing it all on your own, and then being burdened with it for decades. Like, if you're doing graphical applications, this is the way we should be going. It's easier for package maintainers. It's easier for distros. It's easier for everyone to keep up. It's easier for users, too. I mean, you just, you know, nice little web store. They click on what they want. You know, they can have the beta version if they're publishing the beta version. It's, yeah, it's a nice way of getting stuff done. So, yeah, please, if you're doing anything with graphical apps, please get it on FlatHub. Please contribute to Flatpak. Please put Flatpak in your distro. Um, and is there any other questions? Because, yes, right at the back there. You've addressed the outstanding question about CPU architecture, which is a great question. How do you feel about the fact, and I, I realize I'm asking a Linux question of a Linux distro maintainer, but how do you feel about the fact that containers tie everyone in the world to the Linux kernel interface as their interface, shutting out other open kernel options like the BSDs from participating in that ecosystem. And that the overall drive towards containers is further um, orphaning these already minimally represented but very, very strong options in other kernels. 
that strong, um, but I mean, I guess the recurring, the recurring point I get to with all of this kind of thing is, you know, niche players are great for playing in niches. You know, when you're talking about something that needs to have widespread adoption and or widespread contribution, you know, some degree of centralization does make sense. You know, it doesn't make sense for everybody to go make their own kernel. It doesn't make sense for everybody to make their own distribution. Um, I would say it doesn't make sense for everybody to go packaging their own graphical applications 20 times over. So as hard as it is to say to somebody who's clearly passionate about other kernels and yeah, BSDs and what have you, I'm fine with containerization and these technologies dragging everybody to the Linux kernel because that's where the contributions are. So, you know, and as, lo as, as long as the Linux kernel is open to contributions and everybody can steer it in, you know, a good direction, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. Thank you uh, for your talk. I was with uh, the presentation of 2017, so I think <laughs> it's very nice that you changed the views. That year, I also watched the presentation about Atomic from Fedora, so it was uh, funny how those things interlapsed. Yep. I have a question about how you feel about the base system. Uh, you see currently there are trends like uh, Nix and yep. like uh, SteamOS, which use like an immutable image as a base. Yep, yep. Uh, how do you feel about that? So I think immutable distributions are the way to go. Like I think if you're running Linux, it should be immutable. Um, immutability does bring with it a bunch of yeah, extra questions, and you know, and for us as geeks, I think I can say that without insulting anybody in the room. You know, we are keen to tinker with our machines, and of course, immutability quite often can get in the way of that. You know, if you can't change your running system, you, how are you going to install that one little thing that you want? Um, I think there's a uh, there's a, a sweet spot. Um, and I don't think some of the other distributions get it. Um, you know, image-based deployments, you know, you've got a frozen image, you can't really modify that image, or you have to build a whole new one. That, that's too much work. I don't like image-based immutable systems that much. Um, Nix has an interesting way with everything being declarative, but it's a lot of hassle. De declaring everything, it kind of swings the other way for me, um, so I don't necessarily like, like the Nix way. Um, OS tree has you know an interesting take on the whole thing, um, where from a you know both from a user's perspective and and the fact it's immutable, like it's nice, but then you end up with a million different layers of OS tree, and that like, kind of just gets technically burdensome. Obviously, I work on micro OS. I think we found that sweet spot. You know, in our case, we're using BTFS snapshots to do all the magic underneath the hood, where you know your running system never gets touched but you can still do traditional package management against a new snapshot, and that becomes your next boot target. So you're never affecting the running system, but you can do whatever the heck you want with your next boot. And then if that next boot goes horribly wrong, we just throw the whole snapshot away. So, you know, it's super fast, super easy, av avoids all of that. You can still tinker with it, but you're not, yeah. Unfortunately, the downside of that is I do sometimes have to tell people, like, don't tinker too much. Like, the more you do crazy stuff, the more likely you're gonna throw that snapshot away. But it, it, I think that sweet spot is better than super lockdown images or like complete freedom of having to declare everything in a config file. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I had never heard of Flatpak. On my Ubuntu, I'm using a Snap to install application. And on my Mac, I'm using Homebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of Homebrew on Linux? I don't see the point of homebrew on Linux. Um, yeah, it, it's, yeah, why? Like, I get it on Mac. I, I've, I've installed a few things on my Mac that I desperately need there, but, you know, my Mac I use for photography. I don't do anything for anything technical on it. So, yeah, I, yeah, don't see the point. Okay, thank you. Um, how likely is it for the files stored in the home directory, uh, especially the user files, um, to be affected if I roll back a snapshot after a failed upgrade? So, um, yeah, the, that's a really like micro OS specific question. That's cool though. Um, the way we do it on micro OS is 
when we talk about the root file system, we're not talking about the root partition because we're using BTRFS. So BTRFS, you have this concept of subvolumes. We have a subvolume for literally everything where the data should be changing. So home, opt because that's third party, so it's not us. You know, use a local because again, that's not us. Um, you know, anything that isn't the distro is in a subvolume, and then the distro's root file system is just that last bit that's left. So that bit's read only. That's the bit that's managed by the package manager. All the subvolumes are freely available and read write. Um, that does make etc a little bit interesting because that's like the one folder where it's both. Like distros put stuff in there, and that um, in microOS we handle that with overlayfs right now, where. Yeah, we're basically taking copies of that, having knowing what we put there, knowing what the user put there, or at least trying to, and then merging everything together so the thing works. Um, ideally, what we would like is everybody to start using, like, well, like most people already are, user for putting in distribution configs at USR. You know, it should be you know in user lib or user etc or whatever. That's just like you see with system D, right, where distros put their distro config in user lib system D and then users put their local config in etc system D. And that way works very, very nicely. But meanwhile, etc is a bit of a mess, but a mess that we can manage. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, why isn't Flatpak suitable for CLIs? <laughs> Um, actually, it is suitable for CLIs. Um, there's actually guides now for how to do that. Um, I think the... Um, I, so, yeah, and there are examples of apps where they do that, where, you know, they, the assumption is always probably going to be that it's graphical, um, but there's no reason why a graphical application, you know, can't start an X term and, and, and run, a C, you know, run a CLI app. So there's actually examples in the, the Flatpak documentation of how to do that. Um, generally speaking, though, like sort of, you know, for apps that you know might not fit that kind of model, um, I think a lot of that kind of CLI or more sort of service-based command liney stuff, that's handled so well by OCI containers, you know, Podman, Docker, and the like. Like, why, why mess with that? Like, you know, you've got all those containers already out there. You've got everyone building the, you know, command line tooling and server tooling in you know, in containers, you know, that does very, very well in that context. It just sucks on the desktop. Have Flatpak that just handles the desktop issue. You don't necessarily have to have one thing to do everything. So, yeah, I think, I think Flatpak draws that line quite nicely, where it just, it naturally starts getting painful when you head down that road. Any more questions? No? Well, hopefully I will see you in a couple of years when I'm wrong again. Thank you very much.